Welcome back, Lucas. Uh, I just have one item at the top. Uh, the United States uh, looks forward to welcoming Indian Prime Minister Modi uh, for his visit to Washington, D.C. today and tomorrow. The United States and India have a broad and deep relationship, <coughs> and we look forward to talks with Prime Minister Modi and concrete steps to further our strategic partnership. Uh, as many of you know, President Obama will host Prime Minister Modi for a private working dinner tonight, as well as a bilateral meeting tomorrow at the White House. Secretary Kerry will join Vice President Biden, and the Secretary will participate in that meeting. Uh, Secretary <coughs> Kerry will join Vice President Biden in welcoming the Prime Minister to a lunch tomorrow at the State Department with members of Congress, <coughs> the private sector, and the Indian American diaspora. Discussions with Prime Minister Modi will cover the full range of bilateral issues, such as partnering with India on its economic goals and objectives, including its priorities in infrastructure, manufacturing, and skills, and how we can continue efforts to removing impediments to expanding bilateral trade to $500 billion annually. We will also discuss India's energy security, including the use of clean energy and clean technology to meet the needs of India's population. We also look forward to discussing <coughs> Prime Minister Modi's domestic objectives for India, including his focus on sustainable development for all Indians, sanitation and security and defense, and how the United States can partner with Prime Minister Modi on these priorities. So obviously there's quite a bit to talk about. One other topper. Um, <clears throat> the United States welcomes the September 28th announcement by the United Kingdom regarding their launch of a round of talks among the parties of the Northern Ireland Executive with the participation of London and Dublin. We urge all the parties to seize this opportunity to find a way forward on the issues that divide them. We support this initiative to help Northern Ireland build strong institutions, a vibrant economy, and an enduring peace. With that. Right. Um, <clears throat> I'm sure we'll get back to President Modi, but I want to start with the Middle East. Sure. Um, on Friday, Jen, you had some pretty critical comments of um, President Abbas's speech. You said that he used offensive language and that it was essentially unacceptable. That um, The Palestinians, you will not be surprised, aren't very happy about that. They said that your reaction to President Abbas's speech was inappropriate and unwarranted that they ignored <clears throat> the fact that they said, or the facts, and assigned blame exclusively to the Palestinians for the failure of the of Secretary Kerry's effort in, in the peace talks, and that you don't have the courage to name the party responsible for obstructing that effort, quote, namely Israel. Um, and I'm just wondering <clears throat> what you make of that. Uh, if, of that criticism, clearly you don't agree with it. But do you think that your your statement, your comments on Friday, did do that and placed all the blame on the Palestinians? Well, first, it was not just my view. Of course, it was the view of Secretary Kerry and the United States government. I was <coughs> speaking on their behalf. Mm -hmm. um, second, I think uh, his President Abbas is a friend of the secretaries. The Palestinian people are friends of the United States, but uh, we felt the speech warranted. Um, a strong response in, in, in terms of uh, some of the statements that were made. Uh, as it relates to the peace process, uh, which as we know nothing has changed, it's still frozen, but uh, it remains our view that uh, the peace process uh, was no longer moving forward as a few months ago, or stopped moving forward I should say, uh, because both parties didn't take steps uh, that were uh, would have been required to move forward. So. Uh, it was not meant to place blame. It was meant to uh, speak to uh, what we feel is productive in terms of moving towards a two-state solution. All right. The other thing they said is that it was no surprise that your, quote, inflammatory <laughs> remarks came out on the eve of the visit to Washington by Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Is that the reason for the timing, or was it the fact that, the, that President Abbas had given his speech earlier that day? They were in response to questions many of you all understandably had about so, our response to uh, President Abbas's so it, speech. So it didn't have anything to do with Prime Minister Netanyahu at all? It did or not. Or did? It okay. did not, no. Now, I don't know if you heard Prime Minister Netanyahu's speech to the UN today. I did. <clears throat> I w just wanted, this would be very quick, I just want to go through a couple of things that he said and ask you, because the White House briefing was going on at the same time and I don't think sure. your colleague over there got any questions about it just want to run through a few things that he said and, and see if the administration agrees with him. Um, <clears throat> one, he has a theory or believes that Hamas, ISIS, Iran, um, 
and, and Iran are basically kind of all part of the same big thing, which is this, uh, what he would call a scourge of militant Islam. Do you, uh, does the administration agree with that? Uh, we've never heard us state it uh, in that way. We believe they're both terrorist organizations. Uh, we obviously believe that ISIL poses a different threat uh, to the United States uh, based on, of course, the military action and other efforts uh, that are underway. Uh, we don't believe that Prime Minister Netanyahu or uh, anyone uh, else uh, from Israel is suggesting that the United States launch a military campaign against Hamas. So we certainly uh, they are both designated terrorist organizations under the United States designations, uh, but certainly we see differences well, in terms of the threat uh, and otherwise. But, but he he's linked them with Iran as well, and saying that she, it doesn't really matter, Shia or Sunni, they, event, they essentially all want the same thing, which is a Muslim caliphate dominating the world. Do, do you, does the administration believe that that is the case, that Hamas, ISIS, Iran, Hezbollah, all these other groups, Boko Haram, uh, the ones that he mentioned are all part of the same kind of militant Muslim uh, Islamic uh, <laughs> attempt to rule the world. Uh, we would not agree with that characterization. Okay. No. Um, and the, hold on, I just got one more. The other thing is that he was quite critical of um, <clears throat> the UN, uh, the UN system in general, but in particular of the UN Human Rights Commission. You have also been critical of the UN Human Rights Commission, but he went so far as to call it say it, that what it's doing is. Akin to, it should be. It might as well be called the UN Terrorist Commission. Would you agree with that? We would not agree with that. We've obviously voiced concerns when we have them um, about actions that are taken, but uh, no, we would certainly not agree with that characterization. Jim, I wanted to follow up on that. <coughs> sure. Why don't we go Arshad Said and then we can go. Go ahead, Arshad. Do you concur with his, uh, with Prime Minister Netanyahu's judgment that uh, a nuclear armed Iran would be would pose a far greater threat to the world than? Uh, Islamic State militants? Well, I think, um, as I noted a little bit in my answer to Matt's question, obviously we're taking on both threats because we feel both are important. Um, and, you know, with the Iran, the case of Iran and the creation of a, uh, the acquiring of a nuclear weapon, I should say, you know, over the past week and a half, as you know, because you follow this closely, the Secretary had two trilateral meetings. There were countless hours of meetings uh, between, uh, on the technical level, Obviously, we're spending a great deal of time and energy because we are concerned, as is Israel, about Iran acquiring a nuclear a weapon. I'm certainly not going to do rank order. I think, obviously, we're equally, or we're also concerned about uh, the threat of ISIL, given all of the energy uh, that we're putting into that. Can I ask, uh, just on going from what Matt uh, said, I didn't actually see the speech myself, I'm afraid, but if uh, Prem, Prime Minister Netanyahu suggested that the UN should be called the UN Terrorist Commission, would you not say that that was offensive language? I think we've spoken about our concerns in the past. We certainly wouldn't characterize it that way. Uh, we don't see the need for uh, heated rhetoric, um, but obviously there are times uh, when we certainly agree, and we've expressed concerns, as Matt noted, in the past as well about the same organization and how they operate. But you don't think the, uh, equating the world U UN body to a terrorist organization? Or was it the Human Rights Commission? I, I think we equality? certainly haven't used that language. I think that speaks to how we view it. Jen, I just wanted to ask you, what did you find uh, offensive in, in Abbas' speech? What, particular, what in particular was so offensive in his speech? I think, I don't think I need to repeat it. Uh, I mean, say do you that find I'm, the whole speech I'm sure offensive? knowing you, uh, knowing you, I'm sure you read it closely. I and, read it very closely. And but there are the, were the use, was the use okay, of some so, terminology in there that... Okay. We felt we needed to speak okay. to, but I don't think I need to outline okay. that. Okay, so here. so you find the, the that the, the terminology used by, as genocide that's offensive. Is that it? I don't mm. think I think I would point no, you to you, say. Let me finish. Mm. I've already spoken to this. I don't think we need to. It's productive to get into a ba more of a back and forth about it. I will note again that. Uh, the Palestinian people, President Abbas, Secretary Kerry had a lengthy, I think, 90-minute meeting with President Abbas last week. Uh, he'll have ongoing discussions. It doesn't mean we don't voice our concerns when we have them. Let me ask you in a different way. I mean, do you find part of it offensive, the whole thing offensive, 10 percent offensive? What is offensive? I appreciate the opportunity, but I'm not okay. going to go down this okay. rabbit hole let me, with you. Let me just continue on with the, sure. with go the ahead. Netanyahu go ahead, speech say. and so on. Mm -hmm. Mr. Netanyahu said that he wants peace, not as an occupying power but he wants peace because it's good for the Israeli people. I'm paraphrasing, not word for word. Are you concerned that he used peace not as an occupying power? Perhaps he wants the peace maintaining the occupation? 
Uh, I'm not how, do you, gonna, how do you interpret that? I think I spoke to a, a few of the comments made that were asked specifically. Uh, obviously, our view is that a two-state solution is the only way that both parties can live side by side. That hasn't changed. Do you think that Mr. Netanyahu <coughs> perhaps uh, means to say that we want peace, we want quiet with the Palestinians, but we also want to keep the occupied territory? Do you see it that way? I would point you to Prime Minister Netanyahu and his team and see if you want to address questions uh, to and them. I know, just one, my last question mm -hmm. uh, on uh, the, the He's tried to correlate Hamas with ISIS. I know I asked you this many times before. Uh, is Hamas a global uh, terrorist power as, as, let's say, ISIS is? Or is it, let's say, working within a very small, uh, well-defined area? Well, let me s I think I addressed this a little bit earlier, but let me reiterate it. Obviously, we've designated both as terrorist organizations, but ISIL poses a different threat to uh, Western interests into the United States, and that's just a fact. And are you going to respond to the PLO statement about you in particular, your statement? About me? Yeah, the issue the statement think, just a little while ago, or, you know. I, I think, think Matt asked that question, yeah. so I didn't what but I was are you, conveying. Are you, are you going to say, are you going to explain your position? I think I just, repl I think I uh, addressed it, but go ahead. I have two questions on ISIS. Sure. Um, oh, sure, let's, let's finish <clears> this. I guess one more okay? thing from uh, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's yes. speech. Um, he, you know, remember last year he brought uh, that drawing of the bomb and he warned about President Rouhani being a wolf in sheep's clothing and, and um, I don't believe that you guys were prepared at the time to accept that kind of a characterization, but he said essentially, Prime Minister Netanyahu, almost the same thing again today uh, with different words, saying that as soon as or if Iran ever gets nuclear weapons that this charm facade will fall away and the true face of the extremist nature of the Iranian regime will will show itself. D do you share that kind of a fear? Well, Matt, I think... I mean, not personally, but does one, the administration it, it, share the fear if, that... If there is, I, I, will, I will answer your question. If not, you can obviously ask a follow-up. Um, if there is an agreement on a comprehensive, uh, or if there is a comprehensive agreement uh, with the United States, the <coughs> P5 plus 1 in Iran, uh, that will address the nuclear issue. It doesn't mean that there aren't concerns about other issues, uh, whether it's their state sponsor of terrorism, their human rights record. You're familiar with our concerns about the detainment of uh, Americans and, right. and other individuals. Uh, that doesn't change. Uh, I'm not going to make a prediction of what uh, uh, President Rouhani or others uh, may be like should there uh, be a comprehensive agreement achieved. Obviously, our view is that this is the first step to showing the world that they can have a peaceful program and that they can reintegrate into the international well, community. No, no, he was saying if there isn't a comprehensive agreement. In other words, or or you guys settle for a bad deal that, that, that essentially the kind and gentle face that is being presented right now will fall away and there'll be some kind of, I don't know, very scary face there instead, well, we, and, and do, but are you concerned at all that, that Rouhani himself is just is masquerading as a quote unquote moderate and that, uh, and that what they're trying to do is to take advantage of the West um, and, so that they can pr promote, propagate this, what Prime Minister Netanyahu says is this idea of m radical militant is Islam, albeit of the Sh uh, Shia variety? Well, I can assure anyone that an agreement reached would not be based on a term offensive or how that impacts us, but <clears> on <throat> the facts and the details. And we're not going to agree to a comprehensive agreement that doesn't meet our standards and meet our threshold. Right. Okay. But do, do you do, so you do or you do not share Prime Minister Netanyahu's fear that the Iranians are putting up a charm offensive in order to kind of trick the rest of the world into thinking that they're really nice guys when in fact they're actually these uh, militant uh, Islamists bent on world domination? Well, whether or not uh, Iran has increased their PR campaign, which I think uh, you all can speak to the facts of that, what the point I'm trying to get at is that our negotiation and our discussion about a comprehensive agreement is not impacted by that. It's about the facts and the details and what a final uh, technical package is would look like. It's not impacted by what, Prime Minister Netanyahu? By any effort to Wait. do more public relations okay, or do so, more... Okay, so the, the charm offensive or whatever you want to call it that the Iranians have put on is not going to have any impact on you guys in making sure that they don't have the ability to develop a nuclear weapon. Correct. And you don't have this fear that the Iranians are going to try to take over the 
the, the world for uh, militant Shia Islam. I, I can assure you, Matt, that obviously we're focused on the here and now, and our effort is uh, focused on these negotiations and the upcoming deadline in November. I wonder if you <coughs> comment on the Israel announcement for a new settlement today. Is that, you know, does that contradict what Prime Minister Netanyahu called for peace? Is it contradict that? I haven't seen the specific details of that, Saeed. I'm happy to take a look at them. You're familiar with our concerns. I'm, I'm happy to get you around something afterwards if helpful. Uh, well, let's just make sure we're done with uh, Netanyahu's speech, Abbas's speech. Okay. okay, go ahead. Sure. So, uh, you know, the Kobani, the predominantly Kurdish city in mm -hmm. Syria, has been besieged by ISIS for almost two weeks. Uh, more than 100,000 residents have fled. I want to know what the United States has been doing to help the people of Kobani. Well, I think a couple things. One is um, you've seen the announcements from my colleagues over at the Department of Defense about the airstrikes and uh, the effort underway um, to have an impact on the ground, and that certainly is in part in that area. So I would point you, one, to that. Uh, also, we, of course, um, have continued to provide uh, humanitarian assistance. Uh, that's something that is uh, where we are still able to uh, provide uh, across the country and, and in many regions of the country, and that's something that the UN and others are working very hard to do. Uh, but did you have a specific question but, about uh, the the uh, yeah more specifically the rebels there, the Kurdish rebels are saying that they need weapons, and the United States has decided to provide weapons to the Syrian rebels. Are the Kurdish rebels included when you try to arm the Syrian rebels? Well, there are obviously under the SOC there are a range of uh, entities that are a part of that. Uh, that's the train and equip program is something that uh, we'll be implementing over the course of the next year or so, but I can check and see if there's more specifics uh, for you. Jen, who are you working with in, in the SOC? What is the head of the SOC that's working with the United States? Well, we work with a range of officials in the SOC, uh, Lucas. I mean, uh, Daniel Rubenstein has been traveling in the region, uh, reading, meet, meeting with a range of political and military leaders. Uh, we remain in very close contact with them. Because on Friday, um, Secretary Hagel could not name the head of the moderate opposition that the United States was working with, and I was wondering, is there a figurehead that we have designated as, this is our, our man in Syria? It's not a figurehead, it's who the SOC has elected. So we work, but we work with a range of officials on the ground depending on what the entity is and depending on what the needs are. Can you say who that figurehead is? I can. Um, I can actually give you a list of individuals we work with if that's useful, Lucas. <clears throat> Let me see if I can get you a little update on what we've been doing there. Uh, well, let's see. In addition to um, SOC President Albara, we also have had um, a range of officials who have visited. I, of course, you're familiar with the SOC delegation that came in May, um, but Daniel Rubenstein, this is what I was trying to find, um, he spoke, um, he's been in touch with, of course, uh, Albara as well as uh, other leaders uh, in the SOC. I think, you know, the military component has always been a component that we've worked closely with uh, to work through the moderate opposition, so that continues to be the case. And uh, moving over to the Khorasan group, mm -hmm. um, can you tell me the difference between core al-Qaeda leadership and leadership of the Khorasan group? Well, I think, uh, as we've talked about in the past, Lucas, obviously there are uh, groups, affiliates um, of al-Qaeda uh, that we have concerns about. While we uh, feel, and we've talked about a bit in here, including with you, that we have decimated core al-Qaeda, some of the affiliates, uh, we have remaining concerns about. The Khorasan group is a group that we have uh, been watching for two years now. Uh, we don't always talk about that publicly, but we still have concerns about the threat they pose. But the reputed head of the Khorasan group, uh, Mr. Al-Fadli, um, he has ties to core al-Qaeda. Uh, he has ties to Osama bin Laden. His deputy, uh, Mr. al-Nasar, is a third cousin of Osama bin Laden. So is Khor the Khorasan group part of core al-Qaeda? Well, they're affiliated with. So uh, I wouldn't characterize it that way. There's a range of ways that we characterize terrorist organizations. And obviously, we wouldn't have gone after this group if we didn't feel there was a threat that they posed. So, so you say affiliate, but would you say they are part of the group? Well, I think we've characterized it a range of ways, Lucas, so I'm happy to get you a CT briefing if you'd like. Go Can ahead. Can we talk about another affiliate sure. uh, or former member of Al-Qaeda? Yep. Just one brief thing, on, on Lucas's first question, 
you named the head of the SSE Albara, right? But it, there used to be, for, for quite some time, a free Syrian army general who was the commander of the so-called moderate mm -hmm. forces, whose name escapes me. Right. Who's, is he still, he's not still around. So that General Idris, right? Uh, so is there one? Do you, can you, I, can you, can you point to one leader of a unified moderate Syrian rebel group, or are they just in pockets and there isn't any unified no, there, there, there is one, and we work closely with them as well as with Albara, but why don't I get you a list of okay. the different individuals we've been in touch with um, to the degree I can, if that's helpful. Go ahead. Two, two things on the uh, al-Nusra group, which mm -hmm. used to be affiliated directly with al-Qaeda. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they have threatened retaliation against the United States for <clears throat> uh, the attacks on Syria. Do you have any comment on that? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> One second, I'm shy. There's a lot going on in the world. Well, we've obviously seen those comments. Um, I think. Um, We, um, we've obviously seen those comments, uh, Arshad, over the weekend. Uh, as you know, uh, the effort that's underway now is to uh, take on the threat uh, posed by ISIL, posed by the Khorasan group, uh, posed by other terrorist entities uh, within Syria. And airstrikes, as you know, we undertook last week. Uh, we've, we're continuing to build on that. Those are ongoing uh, through the Department of Defense is providing updates on those. Uh, but I'm not sure I have much more of a specific comment, but do you have a... Well, I mean, I'm particularly interested in whether you're <coughs> afraid to ever see a significant threat from al-Nusra in terms of, you know, retaliation. I think we've obviously seen the comments. We watch them closely. Uh, it's a group we've long had concerns about, uh, and obviously I don't think I have anything to preview for you uh, beyond one, that. One oh, other go thing ahead. about that, if I may, um, there are reports that uh, al-Nusra is under some pressure to... Uh, reconcile with uh, uh, the Islamic State militants. Um, do you have any reason to believe that's true, and does that trouble you? I've seen some of those reports, but I haven't don't have any confirmation of that. Um, you know, we're all familiar with what <coughs> happened over the history of uh, of the the, br the breakup, I guess, for lack of a better term. Um, but, but beyond that, I'm not going to analyze what we don't know to be true. One, one last one on Turkey, if I may, following sure. up on. Uh, the, those questions. <coughs> the Turkish uh, government uh, has been reported to be, well, has been pushing <coughs> for some kind of buffer zones in Syria um, that would allow some of the refugees that have flowed into Turkey to stay in Syria and be cared for in some kind of camps there. And as part of that, they have called for uh, a no-fly zone. Exactly. What, what's the U.S. government's position uh, on that? I know General Dempsey spoke to this on Friday, um, and I believe his comment was it's not something we're currently, it's currently a part of our plan. Uh, nothing has changed uh, since then. Uh, so obviously if it's something we're considering, we'll let you all know. And what why, just why, why not? Yeah. Uh, what, what, I mean, you can understand why Turkey or NATO ally has a concern about all the refugees sure. flowing into the <coughs> country. Um, given that you're now engaged in military action there and that you have mm -hmm. a lot of assets in the region and therefore could presumably do a no-fly zone as you did over northern Iraq for so many years, <coughs> what what is the primary uh, concern? I is it that refugees in a Syrian buffer zone would be uh, uh, vulnerable to attacks? Is it that you just don't want to risk the possibility of direct confrontation with the Syrian government forces? I mean, what's the what, what is the reason that this is not on your uh, agenda? Well, I'm not going to outline them publicly, but other than to say that uh, this has been an a or an idea that mm -hmm. has been out there, as you know, for some time. And one, I think it's fair to say that Turkey and other countries have spoken about publicly. Uh, it's not an easy um, thing to implement um, if there were a decision to do that. Uh, but if we decide to do it, uh, or if we're actively considering it, I'm sure we can talk more about it. General, what is your understanding about the uh, Turkish uh, reluctance up until its hostages were released to uh, engage more forcefully as a member of NATO against ISIL? We know that uh, some of their tanks have been stationed 
near the town of Kobani, but are they doing more? Are they doing what should be expected, given that the U.S. has been trying to build this coalition? Sure. Well, I think you touched on it there, Roz. Obviously, Turkey had a very sensitive situation with their hostages. Uh, that's an issue that certainly Secretary Kerry spoke with them about when he was there uh, just two weeks ago. Uh, I think it's important to note, though, that they made every effort. And not only did they participate in the meeting in NATO, at NATO, uh, they came to Saudi Arabia. Uh, they've wanted to be a part of the discussion at every point in the process. Obviously, fortunately, the uh, hostages have been returned. Um, and Prime Minister Erdogan over the weekend, as I'm sure many of you have seen, uh, spoke very forcefully about uh, their interest in playing a role. As you all know, there's a, a discussion in Parliament. We won't get too far ahead of that. but. Uh, that is consistent, certainly, with the conversations that Secretary Kerry and, and as well as the Vice President had with Turkish officials over the course of last week. Is the expectation from this building that Turkey will be more robustly engaged in trying to fight uh, members of ISIL? Well, I think, uh, Raz, I would point you to Prime Minister Erdogan's own comments. President. About, uh, sorry, President yeah. Erdogan. Sorry. Uh, President Erdogan, thank you, his own comments about uh, wanting to be and not wanting to be on the sidelines. And that's not an exact quote, but I think uh, he was pretty forward in his desire to be engaged. Yeah. Let's just do one at a time. Go ahead, Joe. Turkey. Mm -hmm. um, the, as Rose pointed out, the, they've deployed tanks um, to reinforce their side of the border. Do you have any uh, comment on, on this, whether it's a good idea, bad idea? And uh, more broadly, has Turkey actually asked you for any help, um, any U.S. assets, for any help from U.S. assets? Um, I don't have any ask to speak to at this point in time. Mm -hmm. Obviously, uh, as part of our military action that we're undergoing in Syria is uh, is uh, going after uh, some of the ISIL forces that are posing a threat to the border. Uh, so I'd point you to that. As you know, we've provided a great deal of humanitarian assistance as well to Turkey, but I don't have any specific ask to outline for you at this point and in can time. Can I just ask as well, following up on the release of the Turkish, ho Turkish mm -hmm. hostages, did you ask at all um, whether Ankara could help intercede on your behalf to release any of the American hostages? Uh, I don't have anything uh, <coughs> to say on that. Jen, I wanted to ask well, you about the. You've got nothing to say, so you may. There was a discussion about their hostages. I'm not aware of any ask of them on our behalf. Yes, I heard the speech by uh, Foreign Minister uh, Walid Maalim today. Have I Syrian, heard the speech? Syrian foreign minister. I have not actually okay. seen the speech. He's actually he's saying that it was not a surprise to us, the rise of ISIL. We have spoken about it for three years. And uh, it seems that he was right all along. Do you agree? Well, they agree that Syria has warned about the rise of ISIS and something should be done, and it that it is the number one enemy? Well, if Syria has known about it so long, perhaps they shouldn't have let uh, ISIL's uh, safe havens uh, grow and ISIL thrive so much uh, within their borders. So uh, are you saying that they are they are the ones that allowed the ISIS fighters to come in and fight them? Well, I think it's fact, say that, uh, that ISIL was able to their, uh, grow and thrive, uh, grow with their capabilities, grow with their uh, financing uh, within the borders of Syria. And, you know, the President of the United States mm -hmm. spoke to last night, as has uh, the Director of National Intelligence, uh, as have we, about um, what we anticipated and what we didn't. But you do agree that Syria has been fighting ISIL for three years, right? I, I didn't say that. I actually mm -hmm. disagree with that. I don't think uh, the regime, uh, the Syrian regime, is the reason why uh, ISIL has gathered the strength that it has gathered. Um, they've been a magnet for terrorism. They've allowed ISIL to thrive within their borders. Uh, so we actually haven't seen them fighting back over he, the course of the last few years. He also welcomed the, the bombardment uh, of ISIS and, of course, offered serious help that they are fighting, that it's, it's their territory, and so on. Do you have any comment on that? Uh, Does it make any difference what, the, what Syria's regime actually, what is their position on the bombardment? Well, we're not coordinating uh, militarily with Syria. Uh, we did, as you know, uh, last week uh, inform, uh, inform the Syrian perm uh, rep of our intentions. Uh, but we don't have any intention of changing that approach. He also so. called for the return of all refugees without retribution, that every Syrian who was forced to flee the country is welcome to come back. Would that be a good step forward? I'd have to take a look at what the context of that is. Let, let's just do one at the, a time. The growth, of, the growth of ISIL didn't just happen in a vacuum with the only thing in that uh, – that doesn't work, is it? It didn't just happen with the, the – the Assad regime was not just the – was not the only magnet for the growth 
of ISIL. This happened not in a vacuum. There were support for opposition to perhaps one might call immoderate rebels by some of your closest allies, um, some of whom are who are now in the same coalition fighting those people. I mean, that, that was also a reason for this, was it not? It wasn't just that Assad was some kind of terrorist magnet uh, alone. There was, you know, a concerted effort by some of your closest friends to, to get more people in there to try to, to fight him, right? Well, Matt, I think, one, at this point in time, it's important to note that we don't have any evidence of any government funding, uh, but it's worth stating. Uh, obviously, counterfinancing and uh, cracking down on individuals uh, who are continuing to support is one of the uh, effort, uh, one of the five uh, lines of effort of our coalition building. And certainly, we have not held back on our concerns about support for whether it's uh, individuals or individuals who have support of, uh, of, of terrorist organizations in the past. But you do believe that countries, say, Turkey, like Turkey, have the ability to police and control their borders or their border with Syria, right? I mean, a lot of these fighters, particularly the foreign fighters and the ones that we've seen in these horrendous videos of the last century, came across into Syria from Turkey. Matt, you're absolutely right. Do of course, you not and we're think well aware. No, and, and obviously the influx of individuals who are com were coming across the border is certainly an issue of concern that has been discussed. And now I would note, obviously, there's more that needs to be done. But Turkey has, as they've stated publicly, has recently kicked about 6,000 people, I believe, out uh, who were posing a threat. More that can be done. That's part of the discussion we'll continue to have. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Just follow up a couple of questions on Turkey. First, the Kobani uh, that earlier talked about uh, Turkey's pro Kurdish party was in the city uh, last week and he said that the heavy weaponry should be allowed to go to Kobani through Turkey. Uh, have, you, have you talked to Turkish authorities about this? Do you think that these Kurds, Syrian Kurds, should be? allowed to receive. I think that question was already asked. I'll check and see if there's more to convey on that point. Uh, a, another point is a no-fly zone and buffer zone. Mm -hmm. uh, in the past, you stated that you were not uh, received or uh, you have not been proposed any kind of plan by uh, Turkish authorities. At this time, have you been proposed such a plan? concrete plan? I'd point you to the Department of Defense. Obviously, General Dempsey spoke to this on Friday. I don't have anything new to update on that front. President Erdogan also uh, over the weekend when he came from UN meetings said that uh, the army uh, land forces are being discussed among uh, allies. Uh, is there an update you can give us? What, what kind of a land force uh, being discussed again, ISIL? I, I, again, would point you to the Turkish authorities on that. Obviously, they've spoken about what their interests and their intentions are. Uh, clearly, our view is that uh, we're not, as the President has stated many times, uh, there's no plan or intention to put U.S. combat troops on the ground. Our focus right now is uh, working with uh, partners in the region to determine what capabilities and what contributions different countries want not, to make. Not by U.S., but uh, is there no discussion among the allies to put the land forces in Syria? I would point you to those countries to speak to what their capabilities and what their interests are. Are you satisfied with Turkey's level of cooperation at this point, whether uh, foreign <laughs> fighters or uh, in terms of the partnering uh, within the coalition? Well, Turkey is, uh, remains a, an incredibly important counterterrorism partner. Uh, we certainly understand the sensitivity uh, around their hostages, and the Secretary had a a uh, great uh, brief just because of how many different meetings we had, a meeting with Foreign Minister Chavasholu last week. Uh, the Vice President had uh, a, a great meeting as well. So obviously w we've seen the comments of Pre President Erdogan and we'll see where they go from here. You yeah. mentioned Mr. Chavasholu, which is front, uh, Foreign Minister, and uh, Erdogan is a President, but Turkey's Chief Executive is still Prime Minister Davutoglu. Are you talking to Mr. Dovutol as well? When Secretary Kerry was in Turkey, he, he met with him as well, and the Foreign, foreign Minister Chavasholu was in the meeting. Uh, obviously, they have a long relationship, but he's, the Secretary has been uh, working closely with the Foreign Minister. 
Prime Minister. Sorry. <laughs> you know, Each election too many, results. Too many yeah. switch arounds. I wanted to ask you real quick, if you, uh, are you aware of the report by Human Rights Watch that seven civilians were killed last uh, on the 23rd of this month by a Tomahawk cruise missile near Idlib in the village of Kofar including five children? Uh, Said, I think I, I have seen that report. Why don't we get you something okay. after the briefing? Is the, United, uh, uh, is the United States going to do everything that it can do to protect, uh, to prevent the takeover of Kobani by ISIS? Because well, it, it, they're really talking about it, of a dire situation. The people there, more than 100,000 people have fled, and they are at least besieged from three sides, according to media reports. Well, the actions we have taken are evidence of our willingness to take a range of steps. Uh, the United States is helping lead this coalition to take on the threat of ISIL. Uh, the uh, Ambassador McGurk and General Allen will be heading uh, out on the road soon uh, to have discussions with a range of countries and counterparts out there. Obviously, you're familiar with the day-to-day -day military updates that the Department of T Defense is providing, but we're really in a phase now. We are uh, shifting to uh, talking about the expansion of this coalition and talking to each country about what specific role that they can play. Just one more question about the party that uh, in, uh, he mentioned, uh, the Kurdish party, the uh, PYD in Syria. Uh, they, they just had a conference here last week, uh, and you, of course, know that uh, PYD is accused of being an offshoot of the PKK, which is designated as a terrorist group in, by the State Department. Mm -hmm. uh, does that mean, just by allowing them to hold a conference here, does that mean they're not seen the same as the PKK by the United States? I'm happy to check with our team and see if there's more to add on this issue. Um, Afghanistan. Afghanistan. No, no, one more. On okay. Uh, do you inform the Syrian regime every time the American jets want to strike uh, ISIL in uh, Syria or not? Uh, you're familiar with the uh, our contact we had last week. I don't have any other contact to read out for you. But how, how do you think they, they don't use their air missile defense when the American jets go if they don't know that they are going to strike? I think we made our, in our uh, intentions clear last week. Raz? Uh, the inauguration of President mm -hmm. Hani. I know the Secretary put out a statement uh, welcoming uh, the uh, peaceful transfer of power. Mm -hmm. Is the U.S. absolutely 100 percent convinced that by this time tomorrow a bilateral security agreement will have been signed by both governments? Well, the United States and Afghanistan have agreed to sign the bilateral security agreement tomorrow uh, with Ambassador Cunningham signing on behalf of the United States. Uh, this is certainly the plan. Uh, this will enable Afghanistan and the United States and the international community to maintain the partnership we've established to ensure Afghanistan maintains and extends the gains of the past decade. So that is the plan, um, and we look forward to having that signed. Given that uh, this uh, signing is coming pretty much more than a year after originally planned, how is this going to affect the actual changeover from a combat posture on behalf on on the part of the U.S. to a train and support posture? You only have about three months now to get this fully into play. Uh, it's a good question, Roz. I think that um, the Department of Defense and certainly NATO and others are more equipped to address that. I will check and see if there's more they plan to lay out uh, if there are any concerns. But obviously, we've been clear that uh, we were still would still be able to implement uh, as outlined the president's plan from this summer and that's my understanding of, of the case still. There's also the intangible part, the hearts and minds part, the lack of certainty around this changeover in missions. How does this affect the U.S.'s credibility? How does this affect ISAP's credibility with the Afghan people going into 2015 and 2016? the bulk of the time that they're supposed to be in country under this new BSA and, we assume, a SOFA. Well, Raz, this uh, was an Afghan to Afghan negotiation. Uh, obviously, we were there in a supportive role. Um, the outcome is an Afghan agreement that reflects the will of Afghan voters. I think uh, there's certainly uh, – we've seen the Secretary was there just, I think, twice this summer, if not more, twice uh, this summer, and certainly there is an understanding of how committed the United States is to an ongoing partnership with Afghanistan and with the people of Afghanistan. And that's one of the reasons we worked so hard to uh, help uh, Afghans achieve uh, this outcome. Is it realistic to assume that all of the work, all of the money that has been invested in the past 12, 13 years 
is actually going to lead to one, an Afghan security force that is capable of keeping the Taliban and others from regaining power by force, and two, by actually creating a more stable government in a region that is really hit with a lot of instability if by right I'm now. I'm not sure what your question is, but maybe. Is it, is it the kind of situation where with having this supplemental force in place that the ability to neutralize the Taliban once and for all is going to actually happen? Well, I think, Roz, obviously there's a training component of this that um, has been ongoing. And as you know, Afghans have been uh, in the lead, um, and we are continuing to implement that in the, in the months ahead. Um, we are felt committed and felt so strongly about uh, moving forward, of course, with the conclusion of this political uh, situation as well as the signing of a BSA so we can continue to have that partnership. Um, obviously, it has to be implemented, and we need to continue to work closely together to achieve a successful outcome. And finally, is there anything that the U.S. government overall, not just the Obama administration, but the U.S. government overall has learned about how to deal with countries as you move from a war relationship to a post-war relationship? In other words, how do you keep something like this from being so messy so complicated, so difficult, and some might argue so personal, as we saw in one of the lines from the Secretary's statements today. Well, I think, Roz, obviously Afghanistan has gone through a tremendous transformation, and you can always draw from past experiences, but, um, you know, I think in this case uh, we wanted to make sure we could play a supportive role with the Afghans leading the process. Um, it continues to be our belief that uh, that was the right approach to take. Uh, we know that um, the transition they've gone through would have some bumpy roads, but obviously an inauguration and the signing of a BSA are uh, points to uh, be pleased about, and we'll see where we go from here. Do you know I'm signing it on the Afghan side? Um, I do not have that information at this point in time. Well, because they said that, pres that President Connie couldn't <laughs> sign it because protocol demands that someone that's of his that's rank. right. I will check and see. We didn't add before Minister I came out here, Matt, but. But you're pretty sure someone's going to sign it up. Yes, it's not that is be my like understanding. an empty chair next yes. to the ambassador. Right? Yes, tomorrow yes. Go ahead, Joe. The signing of the ceremony will be done tomorrow? That is the plan, yes. And who will represent the United States? Ambassador Cunningham. So I wanted to go to Hong Kong. Sure. Um, if that's okay. <laughs> Okay, okay, let's all go. I think that's a different kind of go to Hong Kong. Are we going to all go and stand <laughs> where, well, are we all going to go and stand with the protesters on the streets of Hong Kong? Um, that was my question, was about the, the chaos that we saw yesterday. Um, I believe things have calmed down somewhat today, but there's still a lot of people out in the streets of Hong Kong. On, of Hong Kong. In the past, um, you said from the podium that the United States uh, broadly supports um, basic law which, mm -hmm. under which Hong Kong is ruled. What is your con oh, do you have concerns about these demonstrations? Have you any message to Beijing um, about how they should be handling it? Well, uh, we're certainly watching the situation in Hong Kong closely. Uh, we support uh, internationally recognized fundamental freedoms, such as freedom of peaceful assembly and freedom of expression around the world. Uh, we've urged and we continue to urge Hong Kong authorities to exercise restraint uh, and for protesters to express their views mm -hmm. peacefully. Um, we, as you know, and ha support universal suffrage in Hong Kong in accordance with the basic law, and we support the aspirations of the Hong Kong people. And we have certainly voiced, consistently voiced our support to China about our support for that, as well as uh, support for the Hong Kong people, and we'll continue to do so. And we have certainly uh, over the course of uh, these events on so the you, ground. So you support the protests that are on the streets at the moment in Hong Kong? Well, I think we, we believe protesters should uh, express their views peacefully. And we certainly believe uh, and recognize uh, fundamental freedoms of speech and peaceful assembly, and so we, we urge them to abide by that. There was a rumor going around earlier that uh, Beijing was ready to send the military in. I believe the Hong Kong chief exec has come out and said that's not the case. Um, do, are, are you concerned that um, the PLA could be sent in by Beijing to squash these demonstrations? I have not uh, seen that uh, potential at this point in time. Uh, I can check with our team and see if that's a concern we have. I was wondering if you would be surprised if I said that I think that what you just said in your original answer sounds exactly like what 
Josh Ernest said at the White House about an hour and a half. I mean, word for word. Would we you are, be surprised if that sounded we, that way? That is the view of, and the position of the United States government. That's what it, uh, what you asked. The uh, Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson said that uh, basically this is an internal matter, and she chastised what she called outsiders for uh, trying to instigate the protesters. Do you have a reaction to that? Uh, well, first, uh, what's happening in Hong Kong is about the people of Hong Kong. Uh, anything otherwise is uh, – asserting otherwise is an attempt to distract from the issue at hand, uh, which is that the people of Hong Kong are expressing their desire for universal suffrage in an election that provides a genuine choice of candidates that represents uh, the will uh, of the voters. Um, so uh, we believe that uh, this can be done in a stable uh, manner, and, and as I mentioned, we're encouraging protesters to to uh, operate in that capacity as well as uh, as uh, authorities. Does the U.S. believe that Beijing is uh, violating the uh, spirit, if not the letter, of the Basic Law by uh, changing these uh, candidacy rules? I think we've expressed our view, uh, Roz, about um, the our belief that uh, our support for universal suffrage. Um, in Hong Kong, I th we've expressed that directly to the Chinese and, and certainly publicly as well. All right, new topic. I, uh, yeah, just very briefly on, sure. on the Modi visit. Mm -hmm. um, I realize this is mainly a White House show, particularly tonight, but there is State Department involvement in the lunch tomorrow. Sure. And the whole Office of Protocol is located over here. That's true. And I'm just wondering if anyone thought that it was really that much of a good idea to host a dinner and a lunch for the visiting president who is in the middle of a fast. Well, I, mean, go ahead. I will say we certainly understand that and recognize it and respect it, uh, uh, his uh, fast. Um, it's a way of honoring an individual. Um, and, you well, know, sometimes there's more formality. Are these people going formality. to be actually eating? I don't have the menu in front of, in front of me, Matt. So he's going to be sitting there drinking his water or lemon-flavored water, and everyone else is going to be chowing down on a four-course meal? In front we can check and see what the menu is if it's of interest I mean, to it you. just – well, no, I just want to, I mean, is there actually going to be food served? Because it seems kind of, I mean, I don't know about what the, what the protocol is, but it seems a little impolite. I mean, you don't, if someone can't eat because they're doing a religious, I mean, you wouldn't invite a practicing Muslim to, you know, lunch in the middle of Ramadan, would you? Matt, I don't think there's any intention. I don't have the menu. I, I'm not we saying don't know what intention. is being served. Uh, however, there's no, well, it's important to know. Well, that. I don't know. I don't, I don't, I'm not saying that you're intentionally trying to be, it just seems kind of odd that they would choose an event like a dinner and then a lunch with someone who can't eat. Well, I would say the goal of President Obama and of Secretary Kerry and Vice President Biden is certainly to honor the visit and have a discussion with uh, interesting uh, high-level guests, <coughs> and, and so that's what we hope So it's going to be less about the food and more about the conversation. Exactly. Is that what you're saying? All right. Is it possible that they would have – protocol would have inquired about the appropriateness of meals that are done traditionally, as you say, to honor visiting dignitaries, and they would have consulted with the President's staff about how to handle this situation? Certainly. That often happens. I will check and see if there's more to communicate to all of you on this particular question. Uh, do we have more on this? Uh-huh. Go ahead. Uh, in your uh, U.S. takes in peace and security in South Asia. Will Pakistan India, uh, will the question of improvement in Pakistan India ties be on the table when uh, Prime Minister Modi meets Secretary Kerry and President Obama tomorrow? Well, there are, of course, a range of topics that I outlined um, at the top. Certainly, uh, peace and security in the region is often an issue that comes up, and I'm sure we'll have more to read out for you as the meetings conclude. And uh, will the uh, human rights issue, which has been associated with the Prime Minister and his party, uh, uh, in the wake of uh, numerous instances of uh, uh, human rights violations of uh, uh, minority communities in India be discussed? Well, I think what will be the focus of the discussions is what I outlined at the top. Uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, On uh, India? Mm -hmm. uh, India, yes. Okay. Uh, you know, prior to the meeting with President Obama, uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi has had met with uh, Chinese and Japanese leaders. I know uh, Asia rebellions would be the topic of discussion. So what kind of support the U.S. is seeking from India in terms of uh, Asia rebellions? Well, India, uh, as is evidenced by the extensive trip that the Prime Minister 
will be doing to the United States. Not just that, I should say, the trip that Secretary Kerry and a range of high-level officials did to India this summer uh, is an incredibly important partner. Uh, there are obviously many, many topics that will be discussed. We remain very committed uh, to the rebalance. India is an important partner, and we hope to continue to grow our relationship and partnership in that regard. And could you define what's the uh, strategic partnership with India? Well, I think I outlined it a bit at the beginning, but obviously there are a range of issues that we work together on, and we hope to continue to grow our relationship, including economic partnership, energy partnership, uh, security partnership. There are obviously a range of issues that fall uh, into that uh, category, including in infrastructure, manufacturing, and skills, uh, expanding bilateral trade. Uh, those are all issues we expect to be topics of discussion over the course of the next 24 to 36 hours. We'll go to you several next. times. Yeah, has India has suggested several times in recent years that it ought to be a member of uh, the uh, permanent UN Security Council. If the issue does come up in discussions uh, tomorrow, what is the U.S. prepared to say? We've spoken to that in the past, Roz. I don't think our position is, has changed. It's exactly the same. We'll see if it's raised. Go ahead. Jen, can you elaborate more on the U.S. position concerning the um, protest in Hong Kong? Um, you mentioned that there has, of course, been ongoing communication with China. Mm -hmm. But have any specific concerns been raised um, about the efforts to repress demonstrators there? Um, and, and if so, um, can you elaborate on what was said? Also, um, China considers the demonstrations illegal. Um, what is the U.S. response to that? And then thirdly, um, is this really an effort, a regression of democracy, or an attempt to cause a regression of democracy in Hong Kong? Let me see if I get all of these. Um, we certainly support uh, the individual's right to protest uh, peacefully. Uh, we encourage them to do that peacefully. Uh, we've expressed, uh, we have been in touch with China about uh, our support for uh, universal suffrage. Uh, obviously, as we have concerns, uh, we will raise them. Um, in term, I missed another one of your questions. What was, can you, what was your first one? Ch also, um, China considers these protests illegal. What is the U.S. reaction to that? And then also, um, is this really, in essence, a regression of democracy in Hong Kong or an attempt to do so? Well, we certainly support the uh, right of individuals to peacefully protest, so I think we just have disagree on that particular point. Uh, we believe that universal suffrage and the ability of uh, the people of Hong Kong to uh, have uh, that uh, a genuine choice of candidates is something that uh, they should have. Uh, that's a concern we've expressed directly to China. Uh, it's been consistent. Uh, so uh, our views just differ on that particular point. Uh, mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, over the weekend, okay, an, just do a few more here. an RPG was fired within a couple hundred yards of the <coughs> U.S. Embassy in Sanaa, mm -hmm. uh, reputedly by an affiliate of Al-Qaeda, a QAP. And I was wondering if Secretary Kerry shared the President's belief that Yemen is a success story in counterterrorism efforts. Well, first, I know there were a range of reports um, about this weekend. So let me clear up uh, for those of you who weren't paying as close attention. Uh, we're aware, of course, of a rocket attack that took place in the vicinity of the U.S. Embassy on Saturday. Uh, social media claims that our facility was the target uh, are uh, false. Uh, there's no credible indication that the U.S. Embassy was the target of the attack. All mission personnel are safe and accounted for. Uh, the Yemeni government is investigating uh, the attack. Uh, in terms of, uh, I think you're referring to the President uh, talking about our efforts to uh, crack down on terrorists in Yemen. And, and clearly, uh, that has been an effort that, or an, an example that he used uh, in his speech uh, earlier this month when he outlined our plans to take action in Iraq and uh, open the door to crossing over geographically into Syria. Uh, we still believe that we've had success and, of course, uh, going after core al-Qaeda and the, um, the elements that have been in Yemen. It doesn't mean that there's not uh, more concerns about security and stability that we need to continue to address. Yemen remains 
Uh, Sana'a remains a high threat post. That's one of the reasons we watch so clo closely and evaluate on a daily basis the security and needs of our personnel who serve there. And is the removal of non-essential personnel, is that still ongoing in Sana'a at the moment? That, that, that has happened, <coughs> yes. We, we're temporar temporarily reducing staffing uh, in response to rapidly evolving political and security developments in Sana'a, uh, but the uh, embassy is, uh, continues to be up and, and running. Sorry, there was damage done to par part of the embassy, wasn't it? Or guard post or something like that? Was it? I mean, uh, when you say in the vicinity, or was it, were those reports incorrect? I b it was in the vicinity, Matt. I, I'm not aware of specific damage to the embassy, but I can I can check on that as well. well All of our I'll, personnel are safe and safe. Right, right. Sound. But I'm just wondering, I mean, it, you know, it, it's an RPG. Are you so inured to just violence like this in Yemen that this doesn't, no, regardless I, of what the target was? I was, was not was. suggesting that at all. I was suggesting that there are a range of reports uh, that have been on social media. Some are, are inaccurate, and so I wanted to make that clear. Right, but whether or not the U.S. Embassy was happened to be the building, happened to be the actual target of this guy with an or woman, whoever it was, with an RPG doesn't necessarily mean that counterterrorism operations in Yemen have been successful. Uh, I mean, unless no, but you I wasn't regard an RPG I attack in a civilian I wasn't answering the question in that regard. One, there were reports that it was a target. I think that's important for everybody to know and understand that's incorrect. Right, but I think Lucas's question was, you know, how can you say that Yemen is a counterterrorism success or hold it up as an idea of how we want to go when whether or not the embassy was the target of an RPG attack or not, there still was an RPG attack in the middle of the capital? Or is that like such a Matt, normal I, occurrence That's now not that at all. You're, you're mixing I, up yeah. all things I said in response to several questions. I think it was important for people to understand that the, the embassy was not uh, was not uh, the target. And, and I think for any high threat post, that's relevant information. Right. What okay. I was referring to was that this continues to be a high threat post. We take, ac we take, okay. we so review and take action uh, in order to keep our people safe. It doesn't mean that we haven't had success in. Uh, okay. Um, I took, I, I was under the impression that your answer to him was, well, t because the embassy wasn't, a, the, we can't tell that the embassy was a target of this, that terrorism is no longer a problem. No, I Yemen. used it as okay. an opportunity to make that point clear because it's been inaccurate information, not publicly. Two, two Sure. One you may not be aware of, but there are reports that uh, shots were fired from the Ethiopian embassy in Washington. Do you have any uh, details I on have not, that? Did that just happen? It happened, I think, in the last couple hours. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we will check that for you, Arshad. Sure. I had not seen that uh, then, before I came out here. One, one other one. Um, there's a U.S. citizen named Mohammed Sultan who has been well, you know the case. Mm -hmm. So um, there is at least one uh, advocacy group that uh, says he's now close to death um, because of his hunger strike in Egypt. Do you have any update on his Why don't case? we get you one? I Thanks. know we've been providing updates as we can, but I didn't have anything new today. Uh, so let me, let me get that. I can just do a couple more here. A quick question okay. on another American citizen named Stacy Addison. From <coughs> uh, he was detained in East Timor for five days and her passport was revoked. Are you aware of this? Is a report. Do you know when it happened, um, Lucas? Recently, I think in the past few days. Okay. Passport revoked. What I'm reading is passport. Uh, anyway, she posted something on social media saying my passport's been withheld. Um, been held for five days. Uh, the investigation will take a year. Um, Why don't we now. take both of those and we'll check with uh, Consular and, Affairs uh, and see if there's an update. On Mexico, real quick. Okay. Just, uh, is there any... I had a question about the, the Marine that's being held there, Tamarasi. Mm -hmm. um, the U.S. government uh, has poured millions into the uh, Mexican justice system, uh, although in public opinion polls, Mexicans have said they have no faith in their justice system. And I was wondering if, um, should, does the U.S. government trust a non-transparent Mexican justice system uh, that's in a case that's now been drawn out for over six months? Well, I think on this, and I'm happy to add this to the list if you'd like an update on him. Obviously, as I've stated in the past, we have uh, been in close contact with Mexican authorities. Uh, obviously, every country runs their own judicial process. Uh, we've visited also Mr. Tamarisi. I think, I don't remember the exact number, but I believe it's more than two dozen times. Uh, so why don't we check on specifics of that as but well? Does the U.S. government have faith in the Mexican justice system? 
I think, Lucas, when we have concerns, we certainly express them. Uh, but in this case, we've been in close touch with Mr. Tamarisi. We'll continue. We care deeply about the case. And I just have to do a couple more because I have to go. Uh, Argentina, mm -hmm. please. Sure, go ahead. Apparently, the Argentinian ambassador has today sent a letter to Secretary Kerry um, saying that if Argentina is declared in contempt of court by a New York court today, then the U.S., he believes the U.S. could be liable for these consequences. Do you have any reaction to that? We will. I'm happy to take that. Uh, no, I haven't well, seen that before. I'd have to take as well. Okay. And that is, you, were, you were quite months ago uh, quite outspoken about the um, anti-LGBT legislation in Uganda. Mm -hmm. It was later overturned. Mm -hmm. There's similar laws going through Parliament or about to be signed in both Chad and the Gambia. I'm wondering if you have anything you could say about that. Why don't we look at those? I'm certain we will have concerns about them, but since every law is different, I just don't want to speak out of turn. Okay, let's just do two more here. Go ahead. Uh, UAE officials confirmed last week that their first female or Air Force pilot has taken part in airstrikes mm -hmm. on Islamic State targets in Syria. Can you comment on that? I have seen those reports, and uh, we, we knew, of course, about it in advance. It's really uh, incredible that uh, this woman had such bravery and uh, played such an important role. And so uh, I certainly have admiration for her also, personally. Also, on a son of Saudi uh, Crown Prince uh, Salman, also joined on the airstrikes. Can you also comment on that? Uh, we've seen that, of course, and I think we also were aware of that. Obviously, uh, there are a range of countries that have played uh, an important role to date. There's more that needs to be done, uh, but uh, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, uh, a range of others who have already participated both militarily and otherwise, and I think this speaks to their personal commitment. Okay, let's just do one more here. Go ahead. Um, today, the leaders of five um, Caspian Sea literal states held a meeting in Asarakhan, Russia, and that's Russia, Iran, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, and Turkmenistan. Um, they signed a joint statement at the end that uh, part of it says, and I quote, non-presence in the Caspian Sea of the armed forces that do not belong to the parties, unquote which, uh, well, the U.S. is not uh, a party over there, but um, I believe has uh, military relationships with at least Azerbaijan. What would this mean for U.S. in that region? Well, we haven't been a, a party to this. I'm happy to have our team take a look at it, uh, but I'll do that after the briefing. Okay, thanks, everyone. We'll do this again tomorrow.